morning. I wanted to announce that we have summer interns who are here for the summer. They'll be here for about 10 weeks. That's Corey and Tyler. So um, you might want to introduce yourself or stick around or get to know them, or maybe you'll get to know them sometime over the summer. We're really glad to have them here, and we're going to be doing a lot of different activities and trying to reach out to the community any way we can think to do so. Um, one event that we're already starting to think about is a sort of summer kickoff in which we might uh, have it here at the building and just grill out and have some sports and games and have things for the old and young and, and for members and for visitors and we want to invite friends and family and people from the community and um, well the interns just got here very recently so we don't have many details yet but I wanted to uh, mention that to you and mention that it's planned for the 16th of June which is 13 days from today so it's a week from this Saturday so today's Sunday, then we'll have Saturday, then the next Saturday. That's a, our summer kickoff. So hopefully we'll have some flyers printed off with more information uh, to give on Wednesday night and then on Sunday, next Sunday, um, for those who would like to maybe give a flyer to someone else to invite them and to know more information. I'd like to examine today some of what the Bible has to say about discernment. Discernment would be... Basically, the idea of making a judgment, of figuring out what we should do in a certain situation. And we'll certainly get into more detail as we go along. I want to just go ahead and, and inform you that we may break down our examination into three parts. First of all, defining what discernment is. Second of all, de demonstrating that it is a reasonable expectation for all Christians to show discernment. It's something that we ought to be able to do, and it's something that we're going to need to do. And then third, to discuss how to grow in discernment. Now, sometimes I have a question just about some particular topic or something that I'm wondering about, and I go to Scripture and try to research it and find what it says and come and report back. But this time, when dealing with discernment, it happened a little bit differently. We've been studying through Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees a lot lately, and then on Wednesday nights in our, in our Bible studies, we've been asking all kinds of different questions that we have. And the idea of using discernment seems to have jumped out time and time again. And so this topic has really presented itself to us. And so I just want to sort of art articulate um, this idea of discernment that seems to be apparent week after week in the things we've been studying. It's been jumping out to me, and I want to share it with you from Scripture. So first of all, defining what discernment is. There's a passage we looked at recently that really opened my eyes and really drew out for me the importance of discernment. And it's Matthew 23, verses 23 and 24. Jesus uh, is talking to the, to the Pharisees here. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Now, I had examined what these three words meant, justice and mercy and faithfulness. And justice was the word that perhaps surprised me the most when you look at how the word is used in scripture and what the Greek word fully means, uh, perhaps it's just me, but I tend to think of justice as when someone really deserves punishment and then you bring down the hammer and give them the punishment that they deserve, that's justice. But this word has a much more broad meaning than just that. It's one of my favorite Greek words in the New Testament, krisis, or it's like crisis in English because a crisis is a point at which you have to make a decision. And if you look at what Thayer's Greek lexicon says, it says this word, justice, or, or judgment, or however you might translate it, it means a separating. So it literally means to separate something, like by cutting something in two. A separating, sundering, separation, a trial or contest, selection, or judgment, opinion or decision given concerning something, especially concerning justice and injustice, right and wrong. So this word is really about making a judgment, using discernment, being able to look at a situation and decide what should be done. 
It's the same word used in John 7, 24. Or this word or form of it is used three times in this one verse where Jesus says, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So even though it's generally translated as justice in most of our translations, when Jesus told them, you've neglected justice and mercy and righteousness, judgment is also a part of that idea. He's saying, you've neglected to use basic judgment, basic discernment in your decisions. Also appears in a similar form in Hebrews 5.14. It says, solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So all of those are accurate translations, justice and judgment and discernment. It's this ability to see what is right and what is wrong. And Jesus sort of perhaps suggests that that's what he's talking about when he says you blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Well, you're not using good judgment if you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. You're not using common sense, even. And that must be part of what Jesus was saying to them. You're trying to focus on all these little details, but you've forgotten basic concepts of discernment between right and wrong. And this sense that I had that this is what Jesus was talking about really made sense out of all of these other passages that we've looked at where Jesus talks to the Pharisees and points out what they've gotten wrong. I want to share with you three examples that help us understand what discernment is and what it looks like when you don't use it. One of those is Matthew 12, 9 through 12. Departing from there, he went into their synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus, asking, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? And he said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? And apparently, since this appears to be a rhetorical question and no one argues with him, the answer is all of them would lift the sheep, sheep out of a pit uh, on the Sabbath. So he says to them, How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. I don't know what Jesus' tone of voice is, but... It almost sounds like he's telling them, use some common sense. Use your head. If it's good to help a sheep out of a pit on the Sabbath, it's even better to heal someone of a disease on the Sabbath. And the way he says, it's, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. There's not a law against doing good. Um, in this case, I would suggest the Pharisees failed to use discernment when they automatically interpreted scriptural silence as prohibitive without considering basic principles of God-given morality. There's all kinds of specific situations and specific questions that we have. And one thing we could say is, well, if the Bible doesn't address it, then no matter what it is, we can't do it. But that wouldn't be using discernment. I mean, the, the Bible doesn't say that we can sit on chairs or sit on pews or uh, we can use multiple cups. It's something that we do here. Or that we could use a microphone and a speaker system. Does it automatically follow that you can't do anything if Scripture doesn't say that you can? Because that seems to be the line the Pharisees were taking. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? After all, uh, we're not given permission to heal on the Sabbath, right? It doesn't address that in the old law. Sort of on the flip side of that would be Matthew 19, 3 through 9. Some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they're no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it's not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So in many ways, this is the opposite situation. In the, in the last situation, there was something where they were saying, well, you can't heal on the Sabbath. You don't have permission to do that because the law doesn't say you can. In this case, basically what they're saying is, well, we can divorce our wives for any reason because... 
the law doesn't limit us to some certain reason that we clearly understand. I mean, we had studied this in a class and looked at the passage in the old law, which talked about giving a certificate of divorce. And the wording was basically, if he has found some indecency in her. And there was a lot of debate among them as to what that meant. But many of them had said, well, it just means anything. Obviously, they weren't using discernment. Jesus shows them a basic principle, which is that marriage is a, is a sacred bond formed by God between two people to tell them, no, you shouldn't divorce for any reason. Um, so in this case, the Pharisees failed to use discernment when they automatically interpreted scriptural silence as permissive without considering basic principles of God-given morality. You know, we have so many questions because the Bible couldn't possibly answer in specific detail every single situation we'll get in and every single question that we'll have. But what it can do is answer many of our questions directly and give us many principles that ought to guide us in other areas. And it seems that you can learn that from looking at the Pharisees. Sometimes the law was silent on something, and so they concluded that you couldn't do anything that it didn't say specifically. Other times the law was silent on something, so they concluded they could do whatever they wanted because it wasn't mentioned. But in both of those cases that we looked at, what they failed to do was use basic biblical principles to help guide their decisions. One more example before we move on, and this is just illustrations that show that the Pharisees had a problem with discernment, and therefore God told them, Jesus told them, you pay attention to all these little details, but you've neglected common sense, really, basic God-given principles of morality. The last one here is in Matthew 23, right before the passage where he tells them that they've neglected justice. He says, Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools and blind men, which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the offering on it, he is obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears both by the altar and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears both by the temple and by him who dwells within it. And whoever swears by heaven swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Now, from what I understand, the Jews of that day had taken what little the law did say about making oaths, and they had made it into this big complex system. It was all these different ways to swear and to swear on different things, and some of them were more, they obligated you to keep your swearing more than the other ways that you might swear. And I don't know if they were just making it all up, but really if you look at what Jesus has already said earlier in Matthew about swearing, you realize that their whole conversation was pointless because Jesus just said, instead of doing all this swearing, just say yes or no and then do what you said. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. So I would say in this case, the Pharisees failed to use discernment when they endlessly debated topics that should not have even mattered in the first place. So there's three different ways that they had failed to show discernment. One was they automatically interpreted silence in the law as being prohibitive. Another would be automatically interpreting it as permissive. And then here, just arguing on and on about something that wouldn't have even mattered to begin with if they had used the basic principles that God had given them. So I think that gives some of the context of why Jesus says, you tithe all these little herbs, but you've neglected justice or judgment or discernment in the process. So that's the first part, defining what discernment is. It's the Christian's ability to perceive and apply basic God-given moral principles to various situations. It's not supposed to be a big, complex thing necessarily. I mean, the things the Pharisees were getting wrong, Jesus seemed a little frustrated because it should have been obvious that they shouldn't have been doing things that way, like prohibiting him from healing on the Sabbath or saying you could divorce your wife for any reason or arguing about whether you're required to keep the things that you swear or not. And hopefully you can already see from those examples that we will need to use discernment. So the second part here is demonstrating that it's a reasonable expectation that all Christians should be growing in discernment. I know it sounds good to say that we all want to be able to discern right from wrong, 
but it could also be kind of scary because it sounds like on the surface, and this isn't true and we can look into it, but it, it sounds like you're saying you're just going to follow your opinions or just, you know, say, well, I feel this way, so that's what I'm going to do. You know, I think we have a healthy fear of getting things wrong. We want the Bible to give us every specific answer in explicit detail because we don't want to do the wrong thing if we just, you know, follow our own human understanding. But there is something in the Bible called discernment or judgment that we are expected to be able to do. If you look at uh, Hebrews five twelve through 14, and we read the last verse of this, this can be a good passage for us to focus on and center on uh, for the rest of the time as we look at the necessity and the importance of discernment and think about how to gain it. It says, Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So he gives somewhat of a distinction here or a definition of what it means to be an infant or to be mature in the faith. This infant doesn't remember the elementary principles of the oracles of God, doesn't really bear in mind even the most basic moral teachings and has someone to t- need for someone to teach them the very basics all over again whereas someone who is mature has their senses trained to discern good and evil through practice but you see built into this language is the idea that we're expected to have discernment he tells them this by this time you ought to be teachers but instead you're infants if you were mature you'd be able to discern good and evil. But because you're infants, when you ought to be teachers, this is a, is a problem for you. So there's an expectation there. It's not an unreasonable expectation to think that Christians should be able to use discernment to apply God-given principles to all kinds of different situations. You can see uh, another instance in which Jesus suggests that this is a reasonable expectation in Luke 12, 54-56. They had asked him uh, for a sign, at least in some of the Gospels uh, preceding this. And and he said, uh, it says here, he was also saying to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say a shower is coming. And so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say it will be a hot day. And it turns out that way. You hypocrites, you know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky. But why do you not analyze this present time? So analyze or discern or to judge what all be appropriate here. He's saying to them, you know, you have common sense. You have the ability to see these patterns happening in the world around you. You use judgment from day to day, but they were unable to use it for some reason when it came to those moral questions which they brought to him and and when it came to accepting him and realizing who he was. Then another passage that really emphasizes that we ought to be able to use discernment is 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 6. So Paul's writing to them, and they are Christians are taking other Christians to court within the church, uh, to courts outside of the church. It says, Does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren? But brother goes to law with brother and that before unbelievers. I mean, you can just hear it in his voice from from his words that he uses. There's an expectation in the church people ought to be able to discern different situations. And I don't know what they were suing each other about, but as I've said, every specific question is not going to be addressed in specific detail in Scripture. They needed to be able to use what Scripture had given them and use it with discernment 
to decide between these brethren, decide between the questions that arose. And so in, in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, it says, Brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. And maturity in Hebrews there is applied to training the senses to discern good and evil. It's also a reasonable expectation because it's based on elementary principles. It's based on basic things. You have need, again, for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You saw that when Jesus said, you know, you, you argue over all these little details, but you've neglected these basic things, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Or in the parallel passage in Luke 11, he says, Woe to you Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice, same word, and the love of God. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You know, something has gone wrong in your religion if you're focusing on all these things and you're neglecting the love of God. I mean, we've got to ask ourselves, do I love God? Is that at the heart of it all? And Jesus said about the greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. A second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. And of course he didn't say, and he was, would have been speaking to Jews, that he didn't say these are the only two commandments that matter, therefore throw the rest out and you'll be fine. But he said the rest depend on these two. You have to start with these basic principles if you're going to understand how the rest of the commandments play out. A great passage to think about love and to see whether basic principles of love are being used in discernment is, is 1 Corinthians 13. If you want to know what to do in a situation, think about what you're considering doing and ask, does it fit these criteria? It says, love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Other basic principle might be faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And that was when Jesus mentioned, he said they had neglected faithfulness. It says, For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Just one more example, just throwing some basic things out, the kind of basic principles that ought to, you know, undergird and inform our decision making would be the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things there is no law. In other words, all of the other commandments that would grow out wouldn't contradict these. So that's that second idea. Discernment is a reasonable expectation for all Christians. It's based on basic biblical principles. The language used in Scripture shows that it ought to be present in our churches. So the important question to, to round out the discussion of discernment is how do we grow in it? And the text itself emphasizes being in the Word. For instance, in Hebrews 5, this central passage that we're looking at, it says everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. So using discernment does come into play when we have to answer questions that aren't perhaps directly answered in Scripture, but it doesn't mean just going the other way, not really considering what Scripture has to say and just trying to use our own discernment that we just muster out of nowhere it comes out of being accustomed to the word you know so engrossed in the word that you've developed this familiarity with it out of the many questions that that the pharisees asked jesus there was one uh, about the resurrection from the dead and a woman who had been married to multiple men in life and uh, whose wife would she be in heaven but Jesus' answer was, you're mistaken, not understanding the scriptures, nor the power of God. 
or the, the NIV says you're in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. The idea is you're not familiar with what scripture says. You, you don't actually understand what scripture is trying to tell you and because of that you're not able to figure out this question that you have very popular passage second timothy 3 16 and 17 says all scripture is inspired by god and profitable for teaching for reproof for correction for training in righteousness so that the man of god may be adequate equipped for every good work so i don't want it to sound like we're saying that um that the Bible doesn't give us what we need to answer our questions. Just because it might not answer every specific question directly doesn't mean that it isn't able to make us adequate and equipped for every good work. It's from being rooted in the Scripture that all of those instances of discernment grow. And not only a familiarity with the Scripture, but a training over time is also emphasized in Scripture. Here in Hebrews 5, it says solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So it's not something that we just have overnight. It's something that we want to grow in over time through practice, through training. And Scripture talks about training in other places, like uh, compares the Christian walk to the training of an athlete except that it's even more important because it's spiritual instead of simply physical. Another instance would be Hebrews 12, 7 through 11. It says, It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? You know, another word for discipline is training. And it's something that happens over time, not necessarily all at once. It says, If you're without discipline, of which we've all become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we have earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplined us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness." You know, something that just really gets drawn out of the text when it compares disciplining a child to the training that we receive is the fact that it's not fun, but over time you're going to gain more of an understanding. I mean, that's what Hebrews said. Our senses are trained to discern good and evil because I would think whenever we, whenever we discipline or train a child, the immediate goal is they won't do something that's wrong and they'll do something that's right. But ultimately, you don't want them to just obey out of fear or out of obligation. You want them to come to understand the principles that are in mind. It seems that God wants us to do that as well. We should obey him even when we don't understand. But ideally, we'll come to a recognition of his wisdom in the instructions that he gives. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So this transformation is taking place over time, and over time, by doing that, we prove what the will of God is, we prove what these things are, That word for prove, it doesn't only mean to demonstrate. Uh, From Thayer's, it says this word is to test, examine, prove, scrutinize, to see whether a thing be genuine or not. So in this case, it would be to show the genuineness of God's morality that he's given to us. But also to recognize as genuine after examination, to approve, to deem worthy. Uh, I ran into something like this uh, when I was in Brazil. I was dealing with... (coughs) people who spoke Portuguese but were learning English, and whenever they would cook something, they would give me some of it, and they would say, prove, you know, prove this. And what it meant was taste it. Taste it and see what, it, what it's like and recognize whether it's good or not. And that's kind of captured in the Greek also. Prove what the will of God is, is see for yourself 
the goodness of God and the goodness of his instructions. It's like Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Yes, God demands obedience even when we do not understand. But he also invites us to taste and see to recognize the goodness of it. And Proverbs 31, 8 actually uses the same word as taste in Psalm 34 when it says she senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She recognizes it. Um, and that's something that ultimately God would want us to be able to do more and more is to recognize right and wrong, to be told clearly certain things that we must do and that we must not do, but also to be able to recognize things that we should and should not do in the specifics of our daily lives. So that's what I found and what sort of seemed to jump out of Scripture from from our study of Jesus interacting with the Pharisees and telling them to have discernment. Those are the principles that I found, that discernment is the ability to apply basic God-given principles to different situations, that it's reasonable to expect Christians to be able to do that, and that we can grow in it if we familiarize ourselves more and more with the Word and if we look at this as a a process of growth over time. If I could just sort of give a a closing thought to all of this, kind of go back to that idea that we're afraid we're afraid to use discernment, so we almost want to act like it isn't necessary to use discernment. You know, we want, we want to say that the Bible has every specific answer to every specific question that could ever be asked in it. But I think we risk being like the Pharisees when we do that and not using discernment because we'd rather just find the answer there. And, and Scripture is full of warnings about quarreling about words. Well, that's what happens when you think that somehow the answer to every question is hidden within the words Um, That's why they debated endlessly, what does it mean he sends his wife away because he found some indecency in her? I mean, they they could quarrel about that word all day long, but if they had just used discernment to apply basic principles, they would have found the answer. Um, So I guess that is meant to be an encouragement for all of us that discernment is not something to be taken lightly. It could be easy to say, well, I'm discerning that we should go this way and just do whatever I want. But there is a legitimate discernment that is grounded in Scripture that can help us to answer the specific everyday questions that are going to arise. And if we can help you to respond to this message or to the gospel, to be baptized into Christ, if we can help you in any way, please come as we stand and sing this morning.